The 1.31 update for EU4 is almost here, and is greatly anticipated for the changes it will bring to the Asian, Oceanic, and American regions. In this massive video, we are going to take a look at the more than 92 new starting and formable nations, missions, and mechanics to come in this free update that will add a huge amount of content and flavor to the world outside of Europe. In this video, I will outline the most important improvements that are coming in 1.31, sourcing my material from the more than 26 developer diaries posted by Paradox Interactive, up to and including February of 2021. With nearly 100 new nations and quite possibly the most added features in the history of EU4, this patch is huge, and this video will cover all content of the upcoming patch, so that you don't have to read any of the logs yourself. This video will be long, but entirely comprehensive, and if you'd like to navigate to the different sections, I'd highly recommend taking a look at this table of contents, which will also be available in the description box below. With that out of the way, let's explore Southeast Asia, the first region to receive a complete overhaul in 1.31. Indochina and the Malay Archipelago are the first regions to receive new starting states and formable nations in the upcoming update. For the peninsula in particular, more than three new starting tags and an in-game formable nation will make an appearance. Within the peninsula, existing states will further benefit from the addition of 64 new provinces and a net increase of 542 development that will supercharge this region into one of the richest zones in EU4. And on the topic of nations, three new, one province minor nations will make an appearance in the 1444 starting date. These include Jirai, Koho, and Raid, positioned in the Zomia Highlands in the region that once belonged to Champa. These tribal animist states were historically ungoverned by the surrounding peninsular polities, and in this upcoming update will prove to be the most challenging starts in the region and potentially in the entire game. They start without the feudalism institution, are not a subject of Ming, and likely possess only three total development, making them perfect for advanced players. And this is especially the case since they start with the stateless society government reform, preventing them from being able to expand, but granting them massive morale and defensive capabilities. While not strictly new, there are also changes to the obscure, revolter, and releasable tags within the peninsula. These nations, seen here, will have far more cores in 1444, allowing you to vassal feed and experiment with tags not often seen in the current patch. Given that a large portion of the new update is dedicated to vassal interaction, more on that later, these cores will prove useful in your quest for expanding your state. But perhaps the most anticipated new change within the peninsula is the addition of the new formable nation of Siam. If you're looking to tie out this superpowered state, you'll have to conquer and unify the plurality of Indochina as a Siamese cultured nation, which itself is a new cultural group consisting of Thai, Shan, and Lao cultures. Siam's national ideas are extraordinary and include 10% army morale, 5% discipline, negative 10% tech and idea costs, plus 2 diplomatic reputation, and a whopping 30% extra manpower, among other notable modifiers. Of particular note is Siam's mission tree, which it shares with Ayutthaya. These new missions grant massive development bonuses to your capital, also known as Krangtup Mahanakan. They also grant claims across the centers of trade in the Malaccas, allow you to detributary Malacca to no-scope their provinces, and even grants you the ability to invade China and take the Mandate of Heaven for yourself. Forming Siam as Ayutthaya is slightly more complicated than other nations, as you'll have to complete your way through most of their mission tree. Outside of Siam, the rest of continental Southeast Asia is also receiving an overhaul, with both new missions and events for the plurality of the peninsula. Cambodia now starts their game in a disaster that lowers their stability and increases their power costs. Lanzong is vulnerable to implode due to their own disasters, and Sukhothai is able to outright vassalize Ayutthaya via event. In terms of missions, Dai Viet, Champa, Cambodia, Pegu, Lanzong, Shan, and the aforementioned Siam are receiving unique trees, with new regional minor missions also appearing for the less relevant states. Highlights of these mission trees include Vietnam's automatic subjugation causes belly on practically all of Southeast Asia, Champa's sizable 20% cultural conversion cost reduction modifier and their huge 25% colonial range modifier, Cambodia's subjugation causes belly on all of their neighbors, and Shan's janky mission stick that automatically integrates all Shan culture groups into their state for free. 
If previous updates are any indicator, we can expect that most of these mission trees will be locked behind a DLC paywall, while the more minor regional missions are likely to be included in the free update. Last but certainly not least, the economic potential of Indochinese states will greatly improve with changes coming to their respective trade nodes of Siam and Burma. Instead of functioning as deadweight top stream nodes, both the Siamese and Burmese nodes will now be able to steer trade from China and further upstream, allowing players in the region to finally make some buckets of ducats. Further to the southeast, the Malay Archipelago is the second main region to receive a notable facelift in the upcoming update. There are a whopping 15 new nations in the region, most of whom originate from previously owned or wasteland provinces. In the Malay Peninsula, Pahang and Kalantan make an appearance. In Sumatra, the anachronistic Acha and surrounding states of Barus, Delhi, Jambi, and Indropura appear. In Java, Blambangan and Bali emerge as tributary states of Majabahit. In Borneo, Sambas, Banjar, and Baro slide onto the scene. And finally, in the Malukas, the animus state of Bone breaks into the zone. And speaking of the danger zone, the two new revolter tags of Damak and Mataram can appear in Java if Majapahit explodes, a likely outcome that is tied to their unique starting disaster. By 1444, Majapahit is the Byzantium of the Spice Islands, and quite literally starts the game with negative 5 stability and negative 50 legitimacy, so you'll have to think quickly if you want to avoid the balkanization of your lands. Perhaps the largest changes in the Malay archipelago relate to its geography. While we don't know the exact specifics yet, around 20 to 60 new provinces have been added in the area, and the region's development has been greatly buffed overall. Mountains and impassable terrain have been added to Sumatra and several other islands, rendering transport ships a necessity for inter-regional travel. What's more, all sea zones adjacent to maritime Southeast Asia and the Philippines are now considered inland seas, meaning that galley ships will be far more effective in naval combat in these regions. Religion in Southeast Asia has also changed substantially, with a greatly expanded sphere of Hinduism and animism supplanting the previously Islamic regions of southern Borneo and eastern Sumatra. Last but certainly not least, all nations within Southeast Asia will also receive new unique missions, with the more powerful states and formables receiving the most potent. Notably, Majapahit, Brunei, Malacca, Acha, and the Spice Islands obtain the greatest gains, though the Philippines, Sunda, and the Sumatran minor nations also have new and unique regional missions. The most notable include Acha's inbuilt Sword of Islam Casus Belli that allows them to convert all Malay cultured nations to Islam and peace deals. Malacca's unlimited subjugation Casus Belli they unlock against all Malay cultured nations after they destroy Majapahit. Majapahit's insane ability to convert all tributaries to vassals and colonize the region more effectively, and the Spice Islands mission rewards that grant an extra permanent colonist and a massive 50% colonial unrest modifier that allows them to use the trade with natives policy to entirely avoid indigenous uprisings. Of course, all other minor nations in the region also receive the newly redesigned Malayan mission group, while Philippine states gain claims across their neighbors, including Madias's claims on Borneo. While the new nations and missions of Southeast Asia are interesting, I'm personally more hyped up for the changes coming to Oceania. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you know that I've been eagerly awaiting Polynesian tags, and in 1.31, I'm happy to announce that we will receive 17 new Polynesian nations to choose from in 1444, including three new formable nations. While incredibly isolated from the rest of the world, these seafaring states will receive a bounty of new provinces and development for your next boat-only World Conquest campaign. In terms of new countries at campaign start, the region of Fiji will include four new tags on the added island provinces of Viti, Vanua, and Lao, with each boasting their own independent chiefdoms. Once you unify these three precarious polities, you'll then be able to unlock the formable nation of Viti. Further to the south, the Maori tribes of what is today New Zealand will receive seven new tags, and the solitary Watahaya on the southern island. Despite Zealandia already existing as a formable nation in the region, the Maori tribes can form the newly formable Ayutoria if they're able to haka their way into unifying the islands. Further to the northeast, Hawaii has been split into the four island provinces of Hawaii, Kauai, Maui, and Oahu, which each form their own eponymous nations. 
If you're able to Kamehameha the disparate states and unify the archipelago, you'll also be able to form the new kingdom of Hawaii, the third formable state in the new update. Last but certainly not least, Samoa to the south has been split, with the new tag of Tonga taking an independent position. And speaking of Tonga, the developers have hinted that they will be the most powerful state in the region, and only their mission tree has been revealed as of the making of this video. From the admittedly vague information that we have, we can deduce that Tonga, and perhaps the other Polynesian tags, will have missions that grant them claims across the Pacific Ocean, allow them to subjugate their neighboring states, permit them to colonize their outer islands, and even attempt a sunset invasion. But missions are not the only new addition to this recently revamped region, and the developers have revealed that more than 40 events that reference Polynesian and Maori culture will make an appearance. Last but certainly not least, the final additions to these Pacific polities include changes to culture, with Maori and Iwi forming the two new subsets of the Polynesian ethnic group. Perhaps surprisingly, there's even a new technology group, Polynesian, which starts at technology level 2 and will probably include a unique subset of pips and graphics for their soldiers and military units. Other aesthetic changes, like renamed estates, will also make an appearance, though there is no definitive lead as to what religion these new nations will follow. It is probable that all 17 tags will be animist, and there is the potential for them to possess unique government reforms that have not yet been observed. The national ideas for both Fiji and the Maori have also been revealed, and they're pretty awful. Hopefully the formable nations of Hawaii, Viti, and Oatoria have ideas that are more viable. Otherwise, players will likely culture swap to more competitive tags. The third and final region receiving an overhaul in 1.31 is North America. This region is long overdue for an expansion, and Paradox have really outdone themselves by adding more than 56 new native nations here in the 1444 starting date. North America will no longer be a barren wasteland or free real estate for European invaders, and in 1.31, there are a ton of new and exciting mechanics to breathe life into Native American campaigns. Perhaps the largest addition to this region are the substantial changes to the way Native American tribes are portrayed in-game. Larger tribal tags, like the Iroquois, are split into multiple independent tribes, which can of course later form confederacies and federations, a topic we will soon cover. Of the 56 new tribes coming in the update, 21 will be located in southeastern North America, more than a dozen will be located in the northeast, and the remainder will be spread about the far north in the Hudson Bay region and the southwest near the Pueblo tribes. Many of these tribal states will share a cultural group, like Iroquois or Huron, and will thus be well suited to forming federations, a topic we will now discuss. Federations are the major mechanic in the 1.31 update, and are likely to be a paid feature of the corresponding DLC. All tribal states can use this new mechanic to invite nearby nations into a loosely centralized political union. The first tribe to found a federation will be able to name the polity and customize various aspects of the organization. Founding the federation will also make your nation its leader, though maintaining leadership is reliant on another new mechanic known as tribal cohesion. The member state with the highest tribal cohesion can claim title to confederation leadership, and your tribe's cohesion can be increased by ensuring member states belong to your cultural group, maintaining the largest army, and neighboring nearby hostile colonial European states. Unfortunately, information about federations is a bit limited at this time, but we can safely assume that tribal members fall somewhere between a political alliance and loosely organized subject states. The second major redesign of Native American states is the mechanic of migrations and tribal land. While migration has existed in EU4 for quite some time, the mechanic is receiving a massive overhaul in the upcoming update. Over time, migratory tribes will gain province devastation in their capital territory linked to the overexploitation of local wildlife. To avoid economic collapse, tribal tags will now be able to migrate to new provinces at the cost of 50 military power, which is no longer tied to a cooldown. When you migrate to a new province, your previously owned land can be transformed into tribal territory under your control for 100 administrative monarch power, which functions as a sort of seasonal territory for your nation. Presumably, this tribal land will confer economic bonuses of some sort, though other tribes can and will still migrate into these regions. 
tribal land is demarcated as a transparent border within your state on the world map. And if enemy natives or Europeans expand into this territory, you'll gain access to unique Casas Bellies that will allow you to expel them from the region. If you migrate across sea lanes or disconnect from your tribal territories, they will unfortunately be deleted. And once you sufficiently advance through your tribal reforms, you'll be able to upgrade all of your tribal territories into full cores at the cost of 50 diplomatic monarch power. On the topic of tribal governments, all tribes will possess updated reform mechanics in the new update. As your tribe expands and progresses technologically, you can invest through five tiers of new government reforms, which eventually allow you to settle land without incurring devastation, reform your technology off of neighboring Europeans, and permit you to transform your tribe into a more useful government form, like a monarchy, republic, theocracy, or even a nomadic horde. Presumably, this will be a paid feature unique to the DLC accompanying the update, although it is probable that owning Dharma or Conquest of Paradise will also unlock these features. In terms of flavor, pre-Columbian North America will receive a bounty of new events and missions that accompany the free update. These flavorful events and decisions will provide players bonuses and setbacks associated with trading with Europeans or other tribes, model secession and migration, or deal with the politics of belonging to a tribal federation. In addition, all totemist tribal states will gain 18 new events associated with their religion, including some that grant benefits that last the duration of your campaign. In terms of missions, all native tribes, regardless of where they are located, will receive a revamped mission tree, with more relevant nations receiving more powerful bonuses. In terms of culture and national ideas, six geographic areas will divide the various tribes, with minor nations in each region gaining access to new and improved generic national ideas. More broadly, the North American continents will gain more than 53 new provinces, and, in conjunction with the 56 new tribal states, will hopefully make the continents more dynamic and interesting to play for your next campaign. Now that we are nearing the end of the video, I'd like to cover a list of the free and paid DLC mechanics that are arriving in the 1.31 update. You should take this list with a degree of speculation, as Paradox has not confirmed clearly if all of these mechanics are free or paid, though they do exist. With that being said, we can analyze EU4's previous updates to make an educated guess on what will come with the update, and in this first section we will cover the free content coming with the 1.31 patch. With the exception of the more specialized missions, government reforms, and tribal lands mechanic, it is safe to assume that all other aspects of the patch that we've covered so far will be free of charge. This includes all 92 newly added nations as well as the corresponding provinces and regions that will be added to the map. In addition, three new national idea groups are making an appearance in the update, and I'm willing to bet that they will be free for all players. These new idea groups relate to your nation's government type, and will replace the plutocratic or nobility ideas if your nation is not a monarchy nor a republic. These new national idea groups have been revealed to be the Horde, Divine, and Indigenous idea groups, and align with steppe hordes, theocracies, and tribal states respectively. All three of these are military idea groups, but they do have interesting non-military applications, like Horde's religious unity and unrest reduction modifiers, Divine's cultural conversion cost reduction and missionary strength increase, and Indigenous's development cost reduction modifiers. For the purposes of policies, they will all be counted as belonging to the nobility group. The second largest free feature of 1.31 is an entire rebalance of the game's naval mechanics. In the update, galleys are receiving an incredibly strong buff, and have had their naval engagement reduced in half, making them hit twice as often in combat. When combined with the increase in inland seas across Southeast Asia and Oceania, this will be a huge upgrade for galley and naval combat in these regions. Another large change to naval mechanics is speed, with more advanced ships traveling faster and more quickly than more primitive boats. My favorite change, however, is a rebalance of how admirals and explorers affect your nation's leader pool. In 1.31, your military and navy will have separate leader pools, which will allow you to have multiple admirals and generals without having to sacrifice your army or navy over the other. Having admirals over your leader limit will cost diplomatic power each month, while having more generals than your limits will cost military power each month like it has in previous patches. In effect, these changes will allow you to have a handful of generals and admirals at the same time without incurring any penalties. 
The last naval change relates to your subject and vassals, with having a large navy now reducing liberty desire in your subject states. With the free features out of the way, it's time now to dive into the extra toppings if you're willing to buy the DLC and support the developers. Continuing with our naval theme from earlier, the first paid feature is an overhaul to the plutocratic government reform. Available to Indian, Muslim, Chinese, or East African technology group nations, 1.31 is supercharging its potential, giving plutocratic players basically all of the mechanics that merchant republics have, regardless of their existing government form. Previously, the plutocratic reform only granted players plus one merchant, but now you can use it to create trade posts, found trade cities, establish trading leagues, and even unlock the new mechanic of drafting transport ships. This new mechanic allows plutocratic governments to hire transport ships en masse, with a cost proportionate to your yearly income. In effect, this makes hiring transport ships more affordable for smaller nations in the early game, with the added bonus of also reducing their recruitment time in half. On the flip side, larger nations will find this mechanic less appealing, as hiring ships as you normally would will cost less of an initial investment. The second paid feature of 1.31 is an overhaul of the existing favor system. If you own the Cassix DLC or the DLC accompanying this patch, you'll now be able to curry favors with allied nations. Currying favors allows you to assign a diplomat to a nation and actively increases your favors with that state over time allowing you to boost their trust or call them into your wars faster than passively waiting each year. The speed with which you can gain favors using this mechanic is boosted by the target's opinion of you and your diplomatic reputation. If you have extra diplomats sitting around, this mechanic will put them to good use and can even be used on nations that are not allied to you, though you should keep in mind favors will now decay in non-allied and non-subject states over time. The third paid feature of the update's DLC is an overhaul of the Regency system. Regency councils will now be replaced by estate regencies, with your nation's most powerful estates taking the reins of power while your heir is too young to rule in their own right. These estate regencies will confer your nation extra bonuses and potentially penalties relating to the estate in question. What's more, you can now extend your regency by 5 years at the cost of 10 legitimacy, which is a great mechanic if your heir is an inbred Habsburg. Regencies will also apply a penalty on increasing your stability, but will no longer decrease your legitimacy over time. The fourth paid mechanic is an interesting feature, particularly for players interested in playing tall. If you like playing small nations with large development, you'll now have access to the Expand Infrastructure button in your province's user interface. All of your provinces with at least 15 development will be able to use this feature to gain two building slots at the cost of a 200% increase to the local governing cost of that state. If you like playing Switzerland, the Netherlands, or any other country that punches above their size, you'll want to check out this mechanic, as the governing cost modifier is negligible compared to the benefits of more manufactories and production buildings in your cities. The final paid mechanic relates to obscure religions, and may or may not be a paid feature, but if previous DLCs are any indication, they probably are. Sikhism, Zoroastrianism, and Totemist religions are finally getting some attention, which is fantastic if you are the three people that actually play with these religions. Sikhism will now allow players to choose between Guru teachings, which grant the player bonuses on top of the pre-existing modifiers that already exist in their historical event list. Fans of Freddie Mercury and Fire Temples will also rejoice, as the Zoroastrian faith will now appear in the Indian province of Daman in the 1444 starting date. Zoroastrians will now also receive a mechanic similar to Coptic Christianity, in that they will have holy sites spread throughout Persia and Asia, which will grant bonuses if you control them, like increased government capacity and other minor modifiers. Lastly, if you're playing a totem estate, you'll gain the ability to worship your ancestors. This mechanic allows you to pick up to 10 stories from your previous rulers, effectively allowing you to stack modifiers that carry over to your future king and queens. From what we can gather thus far, these modifiers function like ruler personalities, although unlike random personalities can be used to grant your leaders modifiers of your own choosing. As of February the 5th, these features and redesigns are current with everything we know about 1.31, though there are likely to be more developer diaries and mechanics that have yet to be revealed. It will be interesting to see what theme Paradox decides to embrace with this update, as its immense scope covers almost everything outside of Europe and Africa. 
It is no exaggeration to say that this update is the largest to hit EU4 thus far, and with over 94 new nations, hundreds of new provinces, and substantial changes to the way that we play the game, is hyped beyond belief, and I personally can't wait to play the new Polynesian states. While no release date is yet confirmed, an entirely new studio has opened up in Barcelona to tackle EU4 expansions, and we can hopefully expect to see this massive patch coming soon in a hard drive near you. Before ending the video, I'd like to thank you for watching this far and supporting the algorithm. If you're interested in staying up to date with EU4 and strategy gaming in general, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel and enforce a personal union over the notification bell. If you want to pick up EU4, DLCs, or any other Paradox Interactive title on sale and at a reduced cost, you can check out my channel's Nexus store in the description box below. This affiliate link directly supports the channel, and any games that you purchase will be given to you in the form of Steam Keys. As always, I greatly appreciate comments and recommendations for future videos, so if you have any ideas, be sure to leave them in the comment box below. Without further ado, it's time to roll the credits.